All right, so uh, as promised today, we'll talk about quantization. So now every day we'll be shifting gears one way or the other. And um, the goal is to see some uh, interesting and unexpected connections between different branches of mathematics. So, so far we talked about parts of topology, but really different parts. Uh, so far, first lecture and second lecture have little to do with each other. Today will be mostly about symplectic geometry and tomorrow about something else. Uh, and interesting thing is that these different areas are neatly connected with each other. So to make sure that we are on the same footing, let me start uh, on the same page. Let me start with a basic example of harmonic oscillator and explain what quantization means in this context. And then we are going to rerun, well, then I state the most general form of what quantization is supposed to be. And then we'll apply the same machinery, which hopefully in this beloved example we understand very well, to problem that uh, will be relevant to quantum group invariance of three manifolds. So in the case of harmonic oscillator, the Hamiltonian or total energy of the system is square of coordinate plus square of momentum. And um, this describes particle oscillating in this Gaussian quadratic potential. So this is x, this is potential uh, v of x, which in this case is chosen to be quadratic, and particle goes back and forth by exchanging its kinetic energy stored in motion with potential energy, which is represented by the height in this, in this quadratic potential. So this oscillation back and forth, as was realized by Hamilton and Lagrange, can be much better described in so-called phase space. So if we plot coordinate x and momentum p on the same plane, basically combine all the variables that enter Hamiltonian, this oscillatory motion is described in a much nicer way by particle moving on a circle. So it just moves constantly on a circle and that describes the state of the system. So these guys, uh, back centuries ago, thought that, aha, uh -huh, the circle, which is essentially constant energy slice in this phase space, is a good way to describe the motion of a system, at least classically. And indeed, in classical mechanics, that's, that's what we use. So then, they notice the following, that this phase space is a nice example of a symplectic manifold because there are always as many coordinates as momenta, so the dimension of a phase space is always even, real dimension. And also it comes naturally with a symplectic structure. In this case, in this boring example, it's just dp wedge dx, which is flat symplectic form to form on a plane. In this case, the phase space is just a plane. So, and, and uh, the circle here, which is not very round in my drawing, but it's supposed to be round, is Lagrangian submanifold. So in classical mechanics, we describe state of a system by choice of a Lagrangian submanifold. I remind you the definition that in this case, it's curve C, which is a circle, but more generally, uh, some submanifold C in symplectic space M is called Lagrangian if it's mid-dimensional and has the following crucial property that restriction of the symplectic form to C vanishes. Okay. What this means is, so this is the restatement again of uh, state in a classical system. What this means is that locally uh, on C, our symplectic form omega is uh, closed and exact. Locally, it should be exact then. And we can introduce the so-called Liouville form. Uh, I'll call it theta, which is the primitive of omega. It may not be uh, globally exact on all of C, but at least locally, we can always write it like this. And in the present example, it's, uh, we can make it very explicit. It's simply uh, PDX, right? primitive of dPdx. Now, these guys noted that not only uh, classical systems and classical dynamics can be nicely restated in the language of symplectic geometry, this language is actually very useful for everything we know and can be pushed even to quantum world. So in, in a sense, it's not emphasized in courses on quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is really modern symplectic geometry. So, and I want to illustrate for you that this is the case. In particular, we all know that um, in quantum theory, the energy levels of quantum harmonic oscillator have the following form. 
the label by integer, non-negative integer n, and there is this uh, half <coughs> shift correction. And this can be nicely written um, in the following way. Uh, this can be written as 1 over 2 pi in the present system, integral of dp h dx over that disk bounded by uh, circle C. And the way the fathers of quantum mechanics interpreted the statement, this is a semi-classical statement, they basically said that per unit volume of the phase space, uh, unit volume measured in units of each bore, we have one state in the system. And the number of states has to be integer, that's the interpretation of the integer n, and computing the area that the system can explore once it's given energy E, for instance. So this zero locus bounds where how far the particle can wander away from center of this phase space by increasing kinetic energy or potential energy. And all of this area that the system can explore um, is essentially available volume of the phase space. A number of states would be essentially uh, that volume divided by Planck constant h bar. So that's, that's one thing. And here we already see the symplectic form appearing in a very nice way, of course. Uh, we can also write this uh, as integral over C of, of this alluvial form theta. Um, that's, that's another way to do it. Also, we can try to look at um, wave functions associated uh, to particle in various states labeled by this integer n. So we know that wave function should look roughly like this. Uh, of course, it should vanish and probably quickly enough at infinity because particle cannot penetrate this uh, potential barrier, but it's localized somewhere here, oscillating back and forth and so on. Um, and these guys also noted that you can compute the wave function Usually a wave function in quantum mechanics is called psi, but I'll call it z for now. Roughly speaking, when h bar is very small, you can write it as exponential of something divided by h bar, and this something can be expressed as integral of this uh, Liouville form theta. So that's another very useful observation. And then, of course, in general, there could be various corrections. And <coughs> let's see, in the present case, uh, this would mean the following. The, so I point out that this is open integral from some fixed point to value of x that you're actually interested in. And um, in this case, we have a very explicit form of this Liouville form theta. So it's, we can just plug it in. Um, it's exponential of i over h bar, then integral over momentum. But since I'm expressing it in terms of dx integral, this will be square root of uh, 2e minus x squared dx plus dot, dot, dot. And if you're interested in, so notice that from what we already know, and this is kind of the answer that we expect, uh, energy levels are quantized in units of h bar. And when things are close enough to classical, namely when h bar is very, very small, the first few levels, energy levels in this harmonic oscillator, have almost zero energy because energy is measured in the same units of h bar. So let's try to evaluate uh, how this looks like when h bar goes to zero, uh, namely when energy is also very small. So for lowest level, for instance. Uh, ground state, uh, as physicists would call it, of the harmonic oscillator. Well, then I can simply say that uh -huh, e is equal to zero here, so I have square root of minus x square, which is of course i times x, and um, what I get in the end is that this behaves as uh, more or less as exponential of minus one over two h bar. I'm not so careful about factors of two and things like that, but what we have is the Gaussian here, okay? And this is indeed, to the leading approximation, how the wave function of a harmonic oscillator looks like in the um, <coughs> first few states 
ground state and a couple of excited state, it has uh, some form of polynomials multiplying this exponential, but if you try to bring everything into exponent, the leading term, which goes as 1 over h bar, will have x squared here, and this is indeed the, uh, what you can get from this semi-classical analysis, which emphasizes the role of the symplectic form and the Liouville form. Okay. Okay. Moreover, what happens in the quantum world is the following. So that's, th this was kind of approximation, often called semi-classical approximation, but one can try to do better. In the present problem, the phase space is parameterized by linear functions on it, x and p, which in the quantum world are supposed to be replaced by operators x hat and p hat, and Poisson structure associated with the symplectic form uh, needs to be promoted to commutation relation between x and p, so we'll have the following rule. p hat x hat equals in some units minus i h bar. Again, don't pay attention to minus signs and twos. I'm not always very careful about them, but it's commutator has h bar on the right hand side, so in the classical limit when h bar goes to zero, they become again commuting functions. So the way we often think about such commutation relation when we want to solve concrete problem that describes how <coughs> molecules of coffee work or how your cell phones operate, we need concrete solutions to quantum mechanical problems. And what we often do in that case, we realize x hat as an operator which acts on various functions of x simply by multiplication. And in that case, it's easy to see that uh, what you need to choose for p is a differentiation operator. So p hat, so hat denotes the operator, is simply minus rh bar ddx. Okay? So that's one particular realization, very concrete realization, where you think of functions as wave functions as functions of x, uh, of what these operators do. Okay? And then what we're supposed to do is what we're instructed to do by rules of quantum theory. In this dictionary, where we go from classical to quantum, so this is classical side, this is quantum side, we were supposed to take the classical constraint, which for us was constraint defined by equation x squared plus p squared minus e equals zero. So that was equation for um, Lagrangian state L in the classical system for particle moving um, in this potential on a circle in the phase space. And we were supposed to replace this by uh, some operator. Every function on phase space by quantization is turned into suitable operator. and this condition in particular gives rise to operator equation which says that one half x squared plus p squared now with hats. So in particular p is a differentiation operator with respect to x minus e um, acting on some function. Again, normally it would be in textbooks on quantum mechanics would be called psi. Oh yes, thank you so much. Yes, p squared. Uh, Right, so this would be called psi of x, and uh, for convenience, I call it z. Uh, this has to be zero, okay? So this equation has uh, good solutions, namely score integrable solutions. This is a differential equation for z of x, because uh, x is just multiplication, p is d dx, so the equation has the form x squared plus uh, d squared dx squared minus some constant acting on function is equal to zero. So this is nothing but familiar ordinary differential equation. It has square integral solutions uh, only for special values of uh, constant e, which is in fact um, in all our normalizations, and if I didn't make any mistake, is h bar times n plus 
Echov. And for n equals 0, um, indeed, you have exact solution to this equation. z of x is really equal to exponential of minus 1 over 2 h bore x squared, just as we found from naive semi-classical thinking over there. So this is supposed to illustrate that we can get uh, quite a bit of mileage. And actually, that's the right way to think about quantum mechanics as, as a problem in symplectic geometry. So we start with the classical phase space, which is symplectic manifold. Lagrangian submanifold there describes state of a system. And then much of it can be pushed to quantum world. Yes? What is say again? Where did you get this expression for E? This, and what is, what is N? Uh, N is just a non-negative integer. So N belongs in Z plus, or Z greater or equal than 0. And um, yeah, you just uh, fish for solutions to this equation. So you look for, uh, so again, um, very concretely, this equation is 1 half x squared plus 1 half, now I should write p squared, but let's just replace p by this derivative. So it will be minus i h bar d dx squared minus e, everything x on z of x. And this is the equation, differential equation we're supposed to study. But, but why, this is, why this is e? It's an eigenvalue problem. Yes, it's an eigenvalue problem. So it, uh, e is a constant. So classically, uh, we had a constraint that system, the state of a system was described by motion where it was exchanging kinetic energy, potential energy, and so on. But convenient way to think about it is that for given energy E, where in this phase space would particle be allowed to sit? Answer, on a circle, right? This is just conservation law, oh, conservation of energy. So claim is that any f classical constraint in a quantum world gets promoted to operator relation. And the way to do it is simply to take um, anything that enters into classical constraint and replace it by corresponding operators. So coordinates on the phase space, such as x and p, become operators. But energy is just um, a constant. It's something that it's a C number and doesn't become operator. Yeah. Did you somehow deduce that e equals h power times n plus 1 half over there? Or was that something that you were writing in the slide? Would you like to repeat the question? Actually, I was going to ask the same question. Would you mind repeating the question? <laughs> Louder, please. So when you wrote, uh, before you mentioned solving the differential equation, when you wrote E equals h bar times n plus 1 half, were you deriving that from something, or are you just taking that as the answer that you have? Um, Yeah, I was actually taking it as an answer to this problem. But uh, at this stage, I was motivating, I was kind of developing it in stages. So I was saying that, yes, from textbooks, we know that this is correct answer. And actually, that's the way to derive it. So now we know the derivation. But I was also alluding to something, uh, something else, that um, this sort of answer, uh, forgetting this plus a half shift, has a very natural interpretation. And I was just trying to put you in a mode of Niels Bohr and uh, Sommerfeld and others who while developing quantum mechanics, thought that the symplectic area here plays an important role. So that's what I wanted to emphasize. So here, I wasn't really deriving this equation. I was uh, alluding to this formula, which emphasizes the role of symplectic structure. And that's really how fathers of our subject thought. So yes. Right, so nevertheless, oh, sorry. Uh, what happens to this definition um, when we have more than one coordinate and more than one momentum? So in that case, indeed, classical states in the system should also be thought of as Lagrangian submanifolds, because that's the notion which gets naturally quantized. So the reason for um, 
Right, and, and this, uh, the question basically uh, anticipates the following fact, that if I fix all the Hamiltonians, all the constants of motion, the system, of course, will be moving on one-dimensional trajectory, right? Whereas Lagrangian submanifold is something mid-dimensional, so dimensions will go apart. But in some sense, it is like choice of Lagrangian submanifold, which is the right thing to consider. And I can explain this a little bit better maybe after the lecture, because it, it, now we'll talk about Chern Simons theory and uh, those um, systems where it will be clearer that Lagrangian is, is, is the right thing to consider. Lagrangian submanifold, not really just a trajectory with the fixed parameters. So um, let me, yeah, I, I, I think I would have to sacrifice some time. And unfortunately, today we're on a tight schedule. So uh, there is a specific point where I want to reach today. And um, let, let's talk after the lecture about this, because it's, it's a little, uh, astray from what we're going to discuss. The reason Lagrangian submanifold is more fundamental to this kind of problems is because, see, what this says in general, that you have phase space where half of your uh, coordinates on a phase space are momenta and half are coordinates, and they don't commute. So in quantum mechanics, we're instructed to express our answers in terms of mutually commuting things. And Lagrangian condition is exactly this constraint that we should look at mutually commuting um, operators, and there are exactly half of them out of all plethora of X's and P's. So that's why. Okay, any, any other questions? Let's see how we're doing on time. Okay, so th this is a familiar example. Let me go away from, from this example, actually. So what, what quantization is supposed to be in, in general? Uh, it's supposed to start with the following data of a symplectic manifold, which I'll call uh, script or curly M to distinguish it from not complement that we used before. And it's equipped with a symplectic form omega. And to this quantization is supposed to associate some uh, vector space or Hilbert space. and by various wave functions and vectors in the space are exactly states of the quantum system. Now, algebra functions on M, M is a symplectic manifold, so depending on whether it's compact, non-compact, there may be uh, more or less functions on it. Uh, to this, we are supposed to associate algebra of operators such that to each function you associate operator and the Bayes commutation relations uh, according to uh, what symplectic form tells us. And uh, if you have classical function, say fi, it becomes an operator which we denote with a hat. And in general, it's a non-commutative algebra. Well, it acts on, these operators act on the Hilbert space. In fact, in this toy problem, we just saw that functions such as x or p or any polynomials in x and p become operators, and they act on states in the Hilbert space, yes? I guess I'm a little confused because um, you're, saying, you're saying that the algebra of functions which should be replaced by some object, the algebra of operators, but then you also, are you also saying that you want to like be able to take individual functions and always have an operator that corresponds to that, in, like that classical function? Yes, that's, that's the desired state uh, of understanding. Not always it can be achieved, but that's, uh, the wish list of quantization. Um, now, uh, continuing with this, uh, Lagrangians, Lagrangian submanifolds such as uh, these curves C sitting inside our phase space um, are supposed 
to transform into vectors, also called wave functions. Um, so let's call them Z sitting in our Hilbert space H. So if I introduce notation H for the Hilbert space, then Z is, is a vector in the Hilbert space. If Lagrangian submanifold classically is described by as a zero locus of some equations, so we have functions fi and zero locus, complete intersection of those equations gives you uh, C, then instructed by, as you can see from this uh, simple example of harmonic oscillator, what's going to happen in the quantum world is that uh, you have operators associated to these functions, fi hat, and they should annihilate the wave function or whatever describes the corresponding state. So we just saw an explicit example of this here where the classical state of the system was described by this Lagrangian condition. Since phase space was two-dimensional, the word Lagrangian is actually not a very strong constraint in this case because we're in too low dimension. But in any case, in the quantum world, we just replaced X and P by corresponding operators, and we got something that's supposed to annihilate wave function that describes quantum state of the same system. So if your manifold is two n dimensional, then that you have n equations. Exactly, and yes. Well, you have yeah, lots of, in this case, it would be not ordinary, but partial differential equations. There'll be lots of them, and um, there'll be lots of integration constants, and so on and so forth. What? Yes. Yeah. And to clarify, you won't always get solutions for any uh, Lagrangian submanifold, right? It's only going to happen for certain ones? Yes. So, um, <coughs> right. So, naively, you would get, for example, right, so there are some constraints, very important constraints. Uh, often they go, again, by the names of Bohr and Sommerfeld, who first observed this kind of thing, and it goes back to here. So, indeed, not every symplectic manifold is a nice quantizable phase space. That's one subtlety. Secondly, not every Lagrangian submanifold describes a state, and so on and so forth. So, there are some delicate points and understanding when it works, how it works, is exactly the subject of quantization and, uh, again, modern symplectic geometry. So uh, I don't think we have, or it's fair to say that we have a satisfying answer to this quantization program. It's really just a wish list. And we know how to do it in very special cases. They go under various names of geometric quantization, deformation quantizations, and then there are various enhancements of this framework. But we don't have a full satisfying theory which handles all cases uh, a priori. Luckily, in, in the problem that we're going to discuss today, it's not terribly important because our phase space will be very nice. So, and uh, all of these questions won't appear. But you're absolutely right. Uh, there will be analog of phenomenon that you pointed out that not every Lagrangian is quantizable. And indeed, that that's, uh, gives rise to a very interesting constraint. Any other questions? Is this clear? Okay, so uh, then what else do I want to say? Here, another general piece of information which works in the full generality is that this function uh, z of x in the semi-classical or classical limit one, h bar is very small, can be written in the following form. Well, it always has the form exponential of i over h bar. 
And then here you have this integral from some fixed value of x to the one where that you want to study of a Liouville form plus dot, dot, dot. Okay. So that's another general fact which fits in this uh, whole dictionary. And this is the rough picture of what uh, quantization is supposed to look like. Yes, it's a parameter that you gain in a quantum world, right? So it's uh, describing, from the viewpoint of algebra functions, it's describing non-commutative deformation of the algebra. And in various problems, it's, uh, but it shouldn't be treated as a formal parameter. It's actually a real parameter that we can measure, of course, right? All our cellular forms operate on principles that rely on specific value of, of this parameter in the real world. So you seem confused. So what can I do to help? Is it Planck's constant? Yeah, it is Planck's constant. It's 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 a number. It's not a formal parameter for power series expansion. It's it's an actual number. Exactly. So, so that's right. So zero, zero is a good point, <coughs> right? So w when it goes to zero, things become classical. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll make things better or worse, but uh, sometimes we also use, and that's. Oh no. So <laughs> sometimes we'll also use Q, as in quantum groups or any other branches of math, and Q describes the same type of deformation. And it's related to what I'm using as H bar by exponentiation. So classical limit or limit where things become simple, commutative, um, put other favorite adjectives, is where this guy goes to one. So. So zero for H bar is a nice point. That's why, of course, it's convenient to sometimes ask, aha, what happens when H bar goes to zero? But in real life, it's, it's uh, small, but non-zero. And it has some particular value. So basically, it's constant, but mathematically Well, mathematically, it's also constant. It's, it's a parameter. I don't know how to say it better. In mathematics, we have parameters, and then we have formal parameters, uh, where expressions only make sense as power series expansions and so on. I want to emphasize that in deformation quantization, for instance, yeah, H bar appears only as a formal parameter. But this is because deformation quantization is only an approximation to, to this quantization problem. It doesn't construct you. Hilbert space doesn't see much of this. In real quantization program, say, with applications to representation theory, or even the ones we're going to discuss in a minute, H bar is a, not a formal, is actual, is actual parameter. Sometimes, for example, um, the oldest quantizability constraints will force H bar to be um, related to integers. I mean, it, it will take discrete values. It will be something like one over the level, and things like that. So it, it's actual number. And, and uh, which values it may take depends on the problem in question. But again, it's not a formal parameter as in deformation quantization because we live in a world where everything works. So. Yes? I had a question about the statement Z, ZX, it's actually in that way you say that you're actually giving me a filter space. I, mean, I think you're assuming H to be L2. Uh, you mean when I'm writing this formula? Yeah, that, that, well, that, th th this formula fits all the constraints and in fact, it, it gives you approximation to z of x even locally in a phase space. It, it actually says nothing about L2 condition. For, to, to test L2, you would have to send x to infinity and see what happens. This is just a local expression which feeds all the desiderata. I mean, before you wrote that, I, I took h to be any like, filter space, not necessarily function. So I, I wasn't thinking z as a function, but when you oh, write yes. like that, you're yeah, correct, exactly. Yes, yes, yes. You're tacitly right. What's happening is indeed we are identifying, at least again locally, Hilbert space with roughly L2 functions on half dimensional space. Yes, yeah. So, yeah. 
Okay, so let's let's go on. Um, time is running, and we're roughly halfway to where we want to be today. So now. The reason I'm explaining all this is not so much because I'm interested in harmonic oscillators or understanding chemistry and you know, binding of molecules, because all of this same th technique, and actually in the language of symplectic geometry, is responsible for understanding topological quantum field theories. So let's apply this to our beloved uh, topological field theory, which is chern simons gauge theory. So as any kind of gauge theory, it comes with, so there are two basic things you can ask to specify or describe gauge theory. Uh, it comes with a certain functional, and in the present case, the functional that you're trying to extremize is the churn silence functional. It's one over H bore, integral of a trace of ADA plus two thirds A by J by J. And integral here is over three manifold M. Now that's not script M, that's the same M that we used last time. <coughs> Where A is a connection on a G bundle. over M, and then you should think of this functional as a, roughly as a Morse function in any framework of gauge theory, and uh, what you typically do in gauge theory, you count <coughs> solutions to some partial differential equations which appear as critical points of Morse function. If Morse function is given by this functional in this case, PDE is whose solutions you're instructed to study, PDEs on three manifold, four manifold, and so on. Uh, here will be just uh, solutions to equations dA plus A by J equals zero, or put differently, flatness equations for the connection A. Okay. This is if you look at TQ of T. And you turn Simon's to QFT as a gauge theory. But then, as you also heard many times in this week, TQFT is a functor that, yes? So when, you're, when you say G bundle, do you mean a vector bundle with um, structure group G or principal G bundle? It's a principal G bundle in this case. So TQFT is also a set of axioms uh, which can be neatly summarized in a functor that maps us from uh, topological spaces to vector spaces and natural transformations and things like that. So let me run this dictionary, or at least a very small part of this dictionary, in the case of Chern Simons theory, because that's where we'll make contact with other lectures in this week. So we have geometry, and here we'll have Chern Simons theory lives in three dimensions, so M is a three manifold, so there'll be something that this theory associates to a two manifold, something that it associates to a three manifold. Well, there is nothing in dimension greater than three because we're, this is a three dimensional TQFT, but you can actually go down. You can ask what it associates to one manifold or a point, and uh, this has been discussed. And this week, so let's call two manifold sigma, three manifold m to confer with notations that we have already been using. <coughs> okay. Now, and then I'll make two other columns here: classical Chern Simons theory as a TQFT and quantum TQFT. Now, classical 
Kern Simons associates to a two manifold symplectic space. Symplectic manifold, which I'll call M, same M that we are using in the problems of quantization. And this is nothing but moduli space of solutions to these flatness equations on the Riemann surface sigma. So I'll call such space of solutions M flat with the structure group G on Riemann surface or two manifold sigma. Okay. And this is indeed an isomplectic manifold. I'll say a few words about it in a second. <coughs> and then and to just the, those are just the connections on sigma unrelated to this manifold M. Uh, yes, so that's just uh, connections on sigma unrelated to manifold M um, because transhumans is supposed to associate something to any two-dimensional manifold and again something to any three-dimensional manifold. So let's consider a case in fact, anticipated by a question, where sigma and m are related. So in particular, one boundary of m is sigma. So that's a natural problem, in fact, kind of problem that we were discussing the other day. So let's assume that um, m is such that boundary of m is sigma. So then to such three manifold m, whose boundary is sigma, we can naturally associate Lagrangian submanifold in this phase space. Namely, we can look at all flat connections or all solutions to this flatness condition on sigma, which can be extended into three manifold M. So the cartoon for this is where you have, um, let's see, I'll draw it here. So you have a Riemann surface sigma bound in three manifold M. And it's natural to, once we have some solution or flat connection on sigma, it's natural to ask, can it be extended into all of M? Of course, there are additional constraints, so that's not always possible. And what happens is that uh, exactly half dimensional space of such solutions allows an extension into M and defines Lagrangian submanifold, which I'll call C. It's sitting inside M. And by definition, it is nothing but space of solutions L flat on M, on three manifold, okay? Now, what I told you in the past 20 minutes or so is that once you have a symplectic manifold and Lagrangian submanifold, this is the starting point for quantization and to every symplectic manifold, you associate a vector space, H sub sigma. Well, it depends, of course, on the choice of sigma, because you look at solutions to something, and so on and so forth. But important point is that quantization turns symplectic manifolds into vector spaces. And it also turns Lagrangian submanifolds into vectors in, this, uh, in the vector spaces. So And now notice that the way a T Siegel axioms are usually summarized for Chern Simons TQFT uh, or even for more general TQFT, we go directly from the left hand side to the right hand side. We kind of skip the middle step, but it's also there. I mean it's it's very legitimate step where you go from geometry to first classical theory and then quantize it. So you can do it in a sequence and actually that, that's very helpful. Uh, but if you want to understand just algebraic or abstract TQFT structure, what often is done in many papers or textbooks, we just go directly from two manifolds, three manifolds uh, with certain compatibility conditions such as one is boundary of the other and so on, to objects on the right hand side all the way to quantum world. Yes. Um, not so easily, no. It's, it's, uh, it's a little degenerate case. In some sense, the answer is yes, you can, but of course what's really helpful to do is to chop the manifold into most elementary pieces and then assemble it back. So unfortunately, 
the answer is, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it won't quite work. So there are some things one can do, but not, not everything. But if you're trying to understand, for example, or even extend this dictionary to one manifold, to which we would associate a category, or zero manifold, to which we would associate a two category, this is actually quite useful. So this sort of dictionary. Okay, so now let's come back to, to our original problem. And let me say a few words about both symplectic manifold that transheimans theory associates to Riemann surface, as well as this vector that transheimans theory associates to three manifold that's bounded by this Riemann surface. First, at the level of symplectic manifold, uh, this M written as M flat G of sigma is, is already good enough starting point because it, it already has reasonable definition. And, um, I just want to say one quick word about it, that this M can also be written as fundamental group of sigma mapped into our structure group G, modular conjugation, simply because all uh, flat connections on Riemann surface sigma are described by their holonomies, and <coughs> holonomies precisely execute such a map. And this space of such representations, homomorphisms from pi 1 to G modular conjugation, is a symplectic space. It carries a natural symplectic form omega, which in notations involving this gauge connection can be written as 1 over 4 pi squared integral of sigma trace delta A wedge delta A. Here the symbol delta means that not only A is a one form on the Riemann surface, but it, we're also looking at its small variation, namely considering differential on the space of solutions. And then it also induces symplectic structure on, on the symplectic manifold M. So importance of this problem was actually anticipated by IT and Bot. who noticed not only the symplectic structure, but made a good use of it way before Chern Simon's theory made it into the world of topological quantum field theories. So this is a very nice problem, which comes from gauge theory, and therefore has a nice mix of information about topology of Riemann surfaces and the structure groups. So it has connection with representation theory as well. But then you can quickly convert it into a problem in symplectic geometry because this is a symplectic space and study it as such. And actually, the outcome that you get is very surprising. So it led a T bot and their followers to a lot of exciting statements about um, bundles over Riemann surfaces and things like that. Now, our interest here is more in three manifolds and, and knots. So I'll say a little bit more about the next step, namely the 2QFT uh, for three manifold with whose boundary is, is sigma. In this case, um, the Lagrangian submanifold which we call C is likewise can be written as a space of homomorphisms from fundamental group, but now this time of three manifold M into structure group G, modular conjugation. <coughs> and as we, this is exactly the problem that we discussed last time. So now you recognize connection to the previous lecture because we studied exactly such space. And we notice that, for example, when structure group is a cell to C and we have only one toral boundary, this is described, the space is a zero locus 
of so-called a polynomial, or more generally, we'll have a bunch of functions, I'll call them AI on the phase space, which cut out a middle dimensional submanifold in that space. Okay? Now, this does look like something I told you about quantization, doesn't it? <laughs> and quantization is supposed to turn uh, these classical constraints into quantum constraints by replacing <coughs> X's and P's by corresponding operators, A by corresponding operator as well. Uh, script M and script C. So this is for three manifold. Th that one is for two manifold, yes. Uh, and I'm keeping in mind this picture where M has sigma as a boundary. So this Lagrangian sub manifold is in flat symplectic. This uh, Lagrangian sub manifold is in inside this symplectic manifold with respect to this symplectic structure. So it's actually a good exercise, in fact, a good homework to verify that oh, I I omega restricted to C as a submanifold inside M would actually vanish. So that's not entirely trivial. I wouldn't call it a theorem. It's a lemma. It's not too hard to show given everything I said so far. But that's justifying the statement that this is Lagrangian submanifold in there. But again, the logic is such that you have more solutions on sigma than solutions on M for obvious reasons. And uh, geometrically, it's, it's very nice. The space of solutions which can be extended into M is exactly mid-dimensional Lagrangian submanifold. So it fits with the symplectic structure very nicely like a hand in a glove. OK, any, any other questions? Yes, please. Uh, so, like, what's the dimension of that script M? Would you mind repeating it? Uh, what's the dimension of script M? Uh, oh, that's another good exercise. And actually, I'll be happy to do it for you uh, if you ask me after the lecture. Uh, but so far, I'll just give you the answer. If genus of Riemann surface is greater than 1, then dimension of M is uh, 2 G minus 2 times dimension of the group. So, and it's related, it's related to moduli spaces of Higgs bundle, sometimes called Hitchin moduli space, and other interesting problems. So, but this result is actually very easy to obtain from the definition. You just look at this homomorphism, and by doing very simple counting, you can derive this formula in one minute, which unfortunately I don't have. I, mean, I don't have this minute, but uh, I'll be happy to do it for you later on. OK, any other questions? Yes. Uh, so that AI, that equation determines the only up to scalar maybe? Correct. Um, in many cases, you don't care. That's the answer. <laughs> so, or it's, it's uh, suggested by the problem itself. So it's dependence on what we called X before, which actually is most interesting in most cases. Not so much that scalar normalization. For instance, if you have some conditions that this should be in L2, or its norm should be 1, or something like that, that immediately nails it down. But that's not so important in concrete questions. Okay, so let me uh, now specialize to very particular three manifold which comes from a knot, namely the knot complement that we already discussed before. And so M will be 3 sphere minus K, which immediately implies that its boundary, which we call sigma, is just a torus. And I'll also take the group to be SL2. 
In fact, we can consider in parallel both cases SU2 or SL2C. Uh, they are closely related since one is complexification of the other. So in that case, we know that the space of homomorphisms from fundamental group into SL2C mod conjugation is exactly the set of points x and y in C star cross C star modulo Z2, which satisfy one polynomial relation, A of x, y equals zero. Okay. And in fact, now you can see that this is indeed the Lagrangian submanifold, not so much complex equation, how a polynomial appeared in the first place, and the space where it leaves, this boring flat space, or C star cross C star, is what we call M in the current approach. So it should be thought of as a phase space or symplectic manifold. And at least the claim that zero locus of a polynomial defines holomorphic Lagrangian submanifold hopefully is, is clear right now, or if not, I'll be happy to explain it further later. Yes? So on, on these four boards, G is first, should I think of it as a compact group or as an algebraic group like SL2C? Uh, could be any, actually. Doesn't matter. Doesn't, at this stage, uh, at this level of discussion, uh, I think every single word I said holds true for either. So, and right here, I'm specializing it for me. Okay, so now let's apply the machinery of quantization to, to this particular problem. It's somewhat ironic because I just erased the blackboard where this was done for general symplectic manifold. So now I'll apply the general principle or general program to this particular M. First thing you can see very quickly is that the symplectic structure, this at blot symplectic structure on the space of flat connections, when space of flat connections on sigma is just C star cross C star in the case of the torus, uh, is very, very simple. It's dy over y, which <coughs> dx over x, and in fact you can very quickly derive it uh, because Remember, we essentially did much of the work already last time when we said that this space is described by holonomies around A cycle and B cycle on the torus. If Riemann surface is a torus, then there are only two cycles. The fundamental group is commutative. X and Y are their eigenvalues. And if you evaluate the general formula for case of the torus and SL2C, you come to this concrete formula. So that's not too hard. Now, this is very similar to our baby problem of uh, harmonic oscillator where there was only one coordinate x and only one momentum p. So in this case, there is only one coordinate x. It's complex, but so what? And um, well, in notations where log of x and log of y are coordinates, this is a flat symplectic form, natural symplectic form on system. Now, in one world, these are supposed to become operators x hat and y hat such that h-bar appears uh, in commutation relations, but again, it's logarithms of x and y, uh, which have flat symplectic structure. As a result, x and y themselves uh, will not obey the usual commutation relations, but they'll q commute in the following way. They'll form the algebra y-x as q times x, y. Okay. So in fact, it's very convenient to, as you see, uh, because of the form of the symplectic structure or this commutation relation, it's sometimes easier to work with um, logarithms of x and y. 
And therefore, let me introduce formal variable n. So first of all, as in um, our baby example of harmonic oscillator, I'll take operator x to act on functions just as a multiplication. So this will be just x time, times f of x. It won't be operator. It will be simply multiplying functions and representation. This is called coordinate representation. And I'll replace it by, it's convenient to pass to logarithmic variables. So let me call log of x n. So if q is exponential of h bar, then um, x is e to the um, h bar times n, and n is a convenient variable. So this will achieve two goals. First, I'm passing to logarithm, and then I'm absorbing uh, this parameter h bar into some normalization. So instead of raising e to the power, I'm raising actually q to the power n. So let's go from. I mean, I'm saying that we can work in x basis or n basis, which is log of x, which is more natural. Uh, the reason it's more natural is because now, with respect to x, operator y uh, will be something nice. It will be simply a shift operator. So then my head acts on such functions f of n by shifting the value of n. So it will be taking n and, and shifting it to n plus 1. Equivalently, what, is, what this is saying is that such commutation relation between x and y is such that if um, x is exponential of something, then y acts as exponential of derivative with respect to that something. So again, I'm repeating in many different ways the same fact that logs are more natural in this problem. Logarithms are much more natural. OK. And um, Q is exponential of h bar. Sorry, does that, does that arrow between n and n plus 1, should that be like y hat of n? What does that mean? Um, oh, this is this, this supposed to be, uh, so we're looking at uh, vectors or various functions that span Hilbert space as before. and. Um, all operators act on them in some way. So what I'm saying is that uh, operator y, now in this x basis or n basis, uh, acts in such a way that y acting on f of n is f of n plus 1. It's a shift operator. And again, the reason is simply that it comes from this commutation relation. So. This is something that you can ponder about uh, quietly, but um, you don't even need any extra facts. Everything is on the board. So I guess if I were to assign this as a homework, it would be just to check that that's, that's a correct state. Yeah, so it's, it's written here. So this is the definition. Right, and n is log of x, yes, up to h bar. And I did it very quickly to absorb h bar to make things quick and convenient, but believe me, that's, that's true. So are you relying somewhat on the geometry of A? Because, like, isn't there a lost choice of operation? Uh, choice of what? Like when you're just setting n equal to some log of x. No, I'm just passing from one variable to another. Um, oh, you mean, um, yeah, let's do it locally and not worry about uh, choices of branch cuts and things like that. In fact, we could have done, I'm, I'm simply trying to help with the symplectic structure, writing it in log variables. We can work in, with x and y all the way. So that's actually what I'm going to do anyhow. So if these definitions are more confusing than x's and y's, forget them. Work with x's and y's. That's good enough.
Okay, we are almost there. So, yeah. Now, what does this quantization program tell us? It says that if you have a state of the system described by zero locus of some operator, Previously, remember, it was zero locus of equation x squared plus p squared minus energy equals zero. Now it is zero locus of equation a of x, y equals zero. Okay? You're supposed to take this guy and turn it into operator equation where there will be a hat of x hat, y hat. And of course, it will also, may also depend in general on h bar or q. So as long as you introduce this parameter h bar in the quantum world, it may enter all of your expressions. And in general, this is what happens. It didn't show up in the Hamiltonian of harmonic oscillator simply because that was too simple of a problem. But um, in general, such accidents don't happen. And since uh, we are working in so-called x basis, where x acts by multiplication, and y involves derivatives with respect to log x, it's actually more natural to view this polynomial a little asymmetrically as a polynomial in Y. Because C, X does something simple and Y does something interesting. It involves derivatives with respect to log X or shifts things. So therefore, uh, in general, if you have, so to emphasize the structure, I can write this A of X as sum over K, coefficients A, K of X times Y to the K. So I will just write it as a polynomial in Y. Uh, what will happen upon quantization is that this guy will become sum over k. Coefficients a k now will become q-dependent. So they'll get dependence on quantum parameter q. They'll get deformed, in other words. And you'll have the separators y hat to the power k uh, standing there. So let me give you an example of how it works. So now it's time to come back to something concrete. I was telling you general theory throughout this whole lecture, even though in the very beginning of this whole course, I promised that everything will be concrete and doable and calculable. So I want in the last few minutes to come back to this and give you a nice homework assignment, which is very concrete, very doable and calculable. Let's take three manifold M which is a knot complement for our favorite knot, this uh, simplest trefoil knot. Okay. In that case, classical A of x, y equation whose zero locus was defining some Lagrangian and so on and so forth was quadratic equation on y. It was uh, of degree two. And you can write it in the following form, y inverse minus 1 times y plus x cubed, where I'm using one of the properties of the A polynomial that only even powers of x show up. So I'll reduce everything by 2. Previously, when we were writing this equation, it had term y plus x to the 6. But I replaced it by cube to lower the powers a little bit to simplify our life. So in this case, classical A polynomial is factorizable. It always has this factor due to abelian flat connections and non-abelian flat connections, and it's a product. What happens in the quantum world, if you apply this quantization procedure, then it turns this A of x, y into A hat, exactly of the same form as, as written here of this general form. And in the present case, it will have the following structure. It will be some I'll call this coefficients a k alpha, beta, and gamma, because in this case, there are only three of them. This is polynomial of degree 2 in y. So there'll be alpha times uh, y inverse plus beta plus gamma times operator y. And In the quantum world, the story is quite interesting. So what was very simple expression in the classical situation becomes fairly involved function of x's and q's. So these are alpha, beta, and gamma in this example. If you run quantization program 
following either deformation quantization or any other approach, this is the answer that you'll find. So quantization will spoil this very non-general structure where things factorize and things will mix in. It will remain as a polynomial of degree two in Y, and um, that's, that's what you get. Okay. So now let me formulate the homework problem and then I'll stop. So sorry for running over time, but there were some questions and, um, well, no, 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 I, I'm really done. So now this is, this is the point I wanted to reach. So, This is our operator that's acting on wave functions should give solution to the quantum problem. Now, let's work in this xy basis or equivalently in the basis of n and y then is a shift operator. Then equation such as a hat acting on z equals zero in the n basis is nothing but the following equation where you have, uh, say, alpha of q to the n q acting on zn minus one plus beta qn q acting on Zn plus gamma of Q to the N and Q Zn plus one is equal to zero. So I'm just rewriting this equation in the interpreting Y as a shift operator and N as a log of X. So uh, here, q to the n is what we call x, and all this alpha, beta, and gamma are certain rational functions of x and q, as, as we see very explicitly over there. So next problem, and that's the homework. Let's try to solve this equation. After all, it could be interpreted as a recursion relation for sequence of numbers Zn. So homework is try to solve this. With the following starting conditions. Um, take Zn to be equal to zero for all n less than or equal than zero. Then take Z for n equals one to be one. And then the goal is starting from this data, find Zn as a function of Q, for instance, for n equals 2, 3, 4, and so on and so forth. It's a very concrete problem. So you have, again, operator relation in basis involving n rather than x. Um, Y operator acts as a shift, so I decided to pass immediately to, to this basis and take the same coefficients, replace x by q to the n, uh, write it as a linear relation, linear recursion relation which relates terms with values n minus one, n, and n plus one. Therefore, if I know two preceding values, I can determine the next one uniquely and unambiguously. So this is a natural choice, let's say that for all negative n's, everything is boring in the past. Starting with n equals one, well, natural 
initial condition is to normalize things so that the first term is identity. That's the reasonable, sensible normalization in any world. And then let's just push it to see what's going to be the next term and so on and so forth by solving it recursively. So for instance, to find Z2, I would obviously choose n equals 1. Then this term will give me Z2. Zn minus 1 would be 0. Zn, in this case, is, is identity. So it gives me Z2. Solve for Z2. Then substitute and solve for Z3. Uh, if you did the first homework, I promise you a surprise. So thank you very much. Any questions? The question was, it's a very, very good question, uh, but it belongs to more general question, which I'll also state. Uh, the question was, in writing a hat, operators x hat and y hat no longer commute. So I made an obvious choice, and in fact, choice here was such that all the y's are to the right of x's, and that was just for convenience. Of course, it affects uh, what kind of coefficients alpha, beta, and gamma we get, because by commuting things, they'll change. So this is a very good question, and it is actually part of a more general question. You could have asked, how the hell did I go from here to here? So, and uh, there is a systematic procedure. 10 years ago, this problem was open, I would say. Uh, people would speculate that, oh, deformation quantization should solve it because you, know, you have a function and deformation quantization is about constructing non-commutative algebras or deformations of such functions. But, there was no concrete tool how to deal with this. And in the past 10 years, in part motivated by low-dimensional topology, this problem was nailed down completely. So by now, people know, at least in the case of curves, how to start with equation like this and turn it into operator in a systematic fashion. And there are lots of choices you make along the way. For example, how to order things and uh, which polarization to use. Again, this is yet another jargon from symplectic geometry. And in the end, you get solution which on which you have full control of all these choices, dependence on polarization and so on and so forth, and ordering. So in particular, it would be good exercise, but unfortunately I don't have time for it, to explain how to get this equation out of here. Uh, basically, you start with a polynomial in X and Y with a symplectic form, and how you produce non-commutative deformation. So that's a bigger question. I didn't explain this. I can give you references, or maybe in write-up of these lectures, uh, I will probably put some information, or uh, in this example, I'll illustrate how to do it, but there is a systematic machinery which does the job. So, so the The kinds of invariants that we get out of it are finite type. Um, Honest answer, I don't know. I don't know. So this ZNs that you compute, they have a name, and you've already seen them before in the first lecture. I'll, I'll of course, say the name next time, allowing you guys to, to do the homework uh, this evening. Um, and, and they're a finite type. But a hat itself can be also viewed this quantum guy as, as uh, some sort of knot invariant. Because we started with the data of the knot and then we did heavy machinery to produce something out of it. And I'm not sure if A hat is itself a finite type. It contains a little bit more information than solution to this operator equation, finite difference equation. And that's, I have to be honest, I, I don't know. That's a good question. Okay.